Morning, I'm Niko Popescu. I'm director for Wider Europe at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Wider Europe is a vague term. In our case, it refers to Russia, the Eastern Partnership countries, Turkey, and the Western Balkans. And today we are here to discuss Russia with a great team of speakers and a great team of listeners. And I probably know uh, most uh, of the people on this call, and it's great to see you here. And of course, the context is a new crisis in EU-Russia relations. Uh, for most of my conscious life, I've been living through diplomatic, uh, political, economic crises between EU-Russia relations. And we, he, we are here to discuss a kind of new uh, such iteration in this uh, dynamic relationship. We're here with Andrei Kortunov uh, from the Russian International Affair Co Affairs Council. And as you know, one of the most prominent, most respected and most profound uh, Russian foreign policy thinkers. And Kadri Liyik, who is a senior fellow at, uh, at ECFR with us and who is also one of the most uh, uh, reputable, profound and respected uh, thinkers on Russia in Europe. So I'm very glad to be here with this team. Um, in the good old days before COVID, uh, we at ECFR used to do so-called black coffee mornings. These were in-person, uh, relatively early morning meetings. And you, we used to practice a thing that we called an interventionist chairpersonship. So don't be surprised if at some point you'll hear uh, me saying a bit more than your average chair uh, normally says. Uh, we do practice this sometimes just to kind of keep uh, a more flexible format, which allows the speakers to, to you know, take their time, but also if if the conversation goes into an interesting direction, the chairs also normally uh, at Black Coffee Mornings had the right to be somewhat interventionist. So we're here to talk about uh, EU-Russia relations after Borel's visit. To me, this visit were, you know, there were three things which could have gone, uh, could go wrong in that visit, and all the three uh, of them did. One, of course, uh, but we are here to discuss that and which are the three things I'll probably uh, uh, say after we hear our speakers. Andre, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nico. First of all, it is definitely my pleasure uh, to be here with you and to share some of uh, my views on what happened and what we can expect uh, from relations uh, between Moscow and Brussels. Uh, I uh, was uh, marginally engaged uh, in a very small way in the preparation of this uh, visit. I uh, met Ambassador Mora, who came to Moscow before uh, Mr. Borrell. I also had a meeting with uh, Ambassador Marcus Ederer, whom probably all of you know. And after the visit, I had uh, conversations with my friends at the Russian Foreign Ministry. So what uh, I will do, I will try to reconstruct the visit, but of course I don't claim to have any insider's information. You know, the uh, trip uh, was really bad because uh, it happened in, in the mid return of Alexei Navalny uh, to Russia. I think that uh, that was a surprise uh, for the Kremlin because uh, uh, allegedly the expectation was that Navalny would not get back. Uh, however, he did against the odds, uh, and that clearly uh, put uh, the Russian authorities into a very awkward and a very embarrassing position. Uh, my take is that uh, there was no fallback plan. Uh, to react uh, to the return of Navalny. Uh, the authorities uh, had to improvise and uh, these improvisations were not uh, always uh, very, uh, uh, very successful. Uh, so the timing was not right. Uh, and uh, my second observation is that, of course, uh, expectations uh, uh, in Moscow, expectations of the Russian side were quite low. Uh, uh, the perception was that uh, uh, Barel comes to Moscow uh, to teach Russian authorities about uh, human rights, about how it should uh, deal with the political opposition, how it uh, should uh, react uh, to street activities, uh, 
Uh, and uh, definitely uh, it was interpreted as yet another attempt by the European Union uh, to uh, interfere uh, into domestic affairs uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, so when Barel again allegedly uh, started uh, uh, raising issues of potential areas of cooperation uh, in, uh, uh, for example, in the East Mediterranean, uh, this conversation didn't uh, get too far because uh, Lavrov argued that uh, the European Union does not even have uh, a common position on some of these issues and uh, basically Russia prefers uh, to deal with partners uh, like uh, uh, Turkish uh, President Erdogan because at least uh, uh, we know where Erdogan stands on, uh, in Syria or in Libya. Uh, and uh, we can work with the Turkish side accordingly. Uh, another point uh, that I would like uh, to make uh, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the trip of uh, uh, Josep Barrel coincided with the expulsion of uh, three European diplomats from Moscow, which you all know, of course. And uh, I think that it would be fair to say that the decision uh, on the expulsion of diplomats uh, was not initiated by the foreign ministry. Of course, it was initiated by other agencies uh, in charge of uh, quote unquote domestic security agenda in Russia. Uh, but uh, the foreign ministry had uh, to take the role of the messenger. Uh, and I think that uh, really added uh, insult to injury, if you wish, it definitely uh, created an additional negative uh, uh, dimension uh, for this visit. Uh, and uh, the rationale for the expansion, the expulsion was quite questionable because uh, after all, uh, if you are a, a diplomat stationed uh, in a country, you have to observe political developments in this country uh, and uh, you have to keep an eye uh, on uh, street activities, among many other things. So I think that uh, there is not clear whether you can uh, draw a line uh, between observing and uh, participating. At least I don't see such a line. I know that some of Russian diplomats are also observing uh, street activities uh, uh, in uh, countries uh, uh, which uh, they are dispatched to. So uh, I think that that definitely uh, was not uh, uh, a good coincidence. And uh, uh, this episode uh, had an impact on the overall outcome uh, of uh, the visit uh, by Barrel. Uh, finally, let me also argue that uh, judging from the statements made by Minister Lavrov and other officials in the Russian Federation, uh, the Russian leadership still sticks uh, to the idea that uh, it uh, can uh, deal uh, primarily with its European uh, par uh, partners uh, uh, on the bilateral level uh, without necessarily uh, uh, involving EU bureaucracies into these uh, bilateral discussions. And that might explain the words of Lavrov when he said that uh, if things uh, go as they go right now, uh, we can uh, uh, stop our uh, interaction with the European Union altogether. I think what he meant was that uh, we can deal uh, with Berlin, with Rome, with Paris without dealing with Brussels. Of course, uh, uh, I think it, it's uh, apparent that uh, this uh, uh, perception reflects uh, uh, certain certain misperceptions about how the European Union operates so on many issues. Uh, you cannot bypass Brussels and uh, you can hardly have good relations with Berlin or Paris without <coughs> having at least decent relationship with the EU, European Union at large. Now, <clears throat> uh, the good news, in my opinion, is that after this uh, failed the visit of Mr. Barrel, both sides tried uh, to downplay uh, the crisis. And in Moscow, they uh, uh, clearly softened their rhetoric. 
and uh, they reaffirmed their commitment uh, to working with the European Union on uh, issues of mutual interest. And uh, if you look uh, at the final list of the EU sanctions, uh, I think that uh, uh, this list uh, uh, should have uh, produced a sign of relief in the Kremlin and a sign of disappointment within the Russian opposition, because uh, uh, this list is uh, very short. Uh, we have only five people on it, uh, and uh, they are deprived from visiting the European Union for only one year, which is almost nothing. And uh, definitely there are no uh, sanctions uh, on Russian economy, which uh, Lavrov uh, uh, somehow alluded to. Uh, and uh, even if you take individual sanctions, definitely uh, this is not anything uh, uh, close uh, to the proposals of Alexei Navalny himself, who suggested that the European Union should include major Russian oligarchs uh, close to the Kremlin into this list. The European Union uh, should uh, confiscate or freeze uh, their property, their assets uh, uh, on the territory of the Union, and that uh, would be a strong signal uh, to the Kremlin. So nothing like that happened. Uh, the list uh, was short. Uh, it was uh, just uh, about uh, uh, heads of law enforcement agencies, and uh, definitely uh, it was. Uh, it should have been interpreted uh, in Moscow uh, as an intention by the European Union not to escalate. Uh, we are still waiting for the Russian reaction. My pre prediction is that it will also be quite uh, uh, symbolic. I think that the intention uh, is uh, to continue business as usual. Uh, finally, let me say just a, a few words about what we can expect uh, in the nearest future. I think that uh, uh, cooperation in select areas will continue. I think that Russia definitely, uh, the Russian leadership is interested uh, in a number of uh, avenues for such cooperation, including the Green Deal, uh, including uh, 5G, uh, including trans-border projects, uh, including select areas in R&D, uh, and uh, uh, education, especially higher education. Uh, I don't uh, foresee a breakthrough. Uh, I think that uh, the Russian approach will be mostly reactive rather than proactive. There are a couple of independent variables at play right now. We, uh, uh, we have to see how the transatlantic relationship evolves. Uh, this is probably the most important independent variable. Uh, we should also uh, uh, watch and see the outcomes of elections in Germany, uh, because of course, uh, if uh, uh, they have a green chancellor in Berlin, it might be a game changer in the relationship, not just between Germany and Russia, but to a large extent, the uh, relationship between the European Union and Russia. I think that uh, uh, it is also important uh, to watch uh, the developments around uh, Nord Stream 2 because it will be an important signal to Moscow uh, on whether the European Union and uh, Germany in particular is really autonomous from the United States or not. Uh, so I uh, don't uh, expect uh, any uh, dramatic changes in this relationship, unfortunately, I think that we lost the opportunity that we had a year ago on the uh, Ukrainian front. Uh, and uh, today, uh, I think uh, there is no appetite either in Moscow or in Kyiv to move ahead on any serious issues and except for uh, the escalation. I think that is likely to stay, but this is not enough uh, to move the overall relationship ahead. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, in this relationship, uh, Moscow is likely to be uh, uh, a deal taker rather than a deal maker, at least uh, for the next couple of months. And since uh, I don't expect the European Union uh, to demonstrate a lot of uh, imagination or uh, new approaches to Moscow, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we will have uh, business as usual. And this uh, new normal that uh, we got after uh, 2014 is likely to continue uh, at least for some time. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Andre Kadri. The floor or the screen is yours now. You're muted, as we know that's the single most used phrase last year, and we keep uh, repeating Indeed, it. indeed. You were muted, now you're not. Now you can hear me. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, we were surprised uh, to see such interest, but we will we'll do our best to be of some help. Um, what do I think about where we stand with Russia? I will also start from the Borrell visit. And I think um, there are two sets of reasons why it turned out the way it did. One is rooted in foreign policy related thinking in Russia. And that has been a long process, long debate about what is the world like and uh, what is Russia's place in it. And second set of issues is domestic, uh, domestic politics, Navalny and, and nervousness. And Reese combined to make Borel visit the disaster it was. Um, let me start from the domestic angle. That has been puzzling me a lot. I don't understand why it was necessary to poison Navalny to start with, because I happen to believe that the Kremlin is correct when they say that he was not the threat to the, to the regime. I, I didn't see him as such. I, he, he's very clever in his exposés of corruption, but that's how far it goes. He has been a single issue politician and he doesn't have a message going convincingly beyond it, though he's trying to expand his appeal now. Um, maybe with some success in, in years to come, who knows, but that was not the case yet. I have even argued that with his focus on corruption, he was part of the system, the way corruption is part of it. He wasn't someone who would introduce a totally different paradigm. So to me, what happened to him in August basically tells about increasing fragility of, of the regime, erosion of system that made Navalny, who was tolerable up to that point, suddenly seem a lot more threatening. And erosion of legitimacy is something you see all around. The way people refuse to vote for United Russia, the way protests, once they start, they keep simmering for weeks and weeks. And I was also struck by the overall distrust of co how government had handled COVID. I wrote a paper about Russia and COVID late last year. And it seemed to me that reality and perception are apart. Actually, the Kremlin didn't handle the pandemic so badly, especially the first wave that centered mostly around St. Petersburg and Moscow. They made the mistakes we all did. Russia didn't stick out in a negative way. But what was striking was, was the society's reluctance to see the government as acting in good faith. So I think probably there are people in the Kremlin or in the services who see all that, feel all that, and against that background, Navalny was suddenly more threatening. The sad paradox, of course, is that being made sensitive by that, the Kremlin also misread the West. There seems to have been a thinking that uh, the freshly united West, now with Biden presidency, will embark on a crusade to protect human rights in Russia and introduce democracy in Russia. So I think Borel visit was sort of aggressive preemption of, of that. They, they thought that the European was, was coming to dictate terms to Russia. But, you know, ironically, he wasn't. That was not the agenda. And that hasn't been in anyone's agenda. Actually, the West has been doing its minimum uh, in terms of rhetoric about democracy promotion in Russia. And had Moscow not arrested Navalny at the airport like that on his way home from Germany, of all places, you know, I don't, I don't think we would have said very much at all. So basically, in the sort of hypersensitivity and nervousness, the Kremlin brought it on. Uh, they increased our rhetoric on, on human rights in Russia. 
that would not have been there otherwise. But that said, there is obviously also the uh, foreign policy background. And I have been following it. It's a fascinating debate. Um, Russia has been wanting, uh, has been calling for multipolar world order for decades. And now that that has arrived, the hegemony of the United States is not what it was anymore. Uh, Moscow doesn't know how to behave in it. The world is a mess. Many people in Moscow openly say that they don't know how to set aims, and a dominant theme has become self-isolation. Let's not invest into relationship in anything. Nothing can be long term. Let's wait it out, uh, so forth. And that is especially relevant about the European Union, because there are few people in Moscow who actually understand the European Union. Andre is among the few notable exceptions, but there aren't that many. The mainstream debate tends to take temporary trends and extrapolate them into long term. So after the Brexit vote, many in Moscow thought that the EU was going to collapse, and it took deputy ministers and ambassadors to explain that you know that's not the case. The EU was created over a long time, and it won't collapse overnight. But basically now they don't know what sort of beast the EU is going to be tomorrow. And that's why they do not want to invest in long-term relationship with us, especially as the only existing framework for that relationship uh, is outdated. And in that, that framework, Russia was a rule taker, someone who was supposed to transform in European uh, fashion, and this is something Moscow drastically rejects right now. Uh, so yes, they might prefer to engage with member states, but even that is less than one would expect. It's, it's not the same as, as it was, say, a decade or more ago when uh, Putin, Schroeder, Chirac were the famous trio then they really saw eye to eye and uh, and there were high hopes uh, now i think what's happening even on bilateral level is is a lot less ambitious and i cannot think of a better example than the uh, initiatives of of president macron that you know moscow treats politely but doesn't invest in it uh, <clears throat> They, uh, they, they engage with France on limited issues, but not on geopolitical order of Europe or, or, or something like that. And that I think tells us something about that position. So what, what can the European Union do in, in this situation? I think frankly, we should calm down and accept that there is little we can do right now because of these two sets of issues that explain Russia's position. Uh, one set, the domestic set, we cannot affect at all. I mean, transfer of power or erosion of regime is a nervous moment and there is very little outsiders can do about it, hardly anything. And the foreign policy logic, we can maybe influence, but that'll take time because we need to show to Russians that the European Union is there to stay for the foreseeable future. That'll take time. Our leverage is inevitably rooted in the overall world order and values that inform it. So for as long as world order is in flux, the European Union's ability to affect matters in Russia is on the question mark in, in Russia. Um, and I think it's a fact of life and we should we should accept it quite calmly. Do our homework, work towards our future leverage. And I am sorry, I always feel frustrated when I say such things to diplomats because I know that you want advice on what you can do right now on your field and that is clearly not, not what you expect. I'm sorry, but, but I think um, that is where our power really uh, stems from there is there is no escape and i think also in terms of human rights um 
and we have been discussing whether to impose uh, sanctions or um, mm, Yes, we had to do some sanctions because we, we obviously had to show what we think and feel about the situation. It was impossible to do nothing. That said, if, if the people in the Kremlin really believe that the uh, danger is existential, then nothing we could do or say, uh, threaten or promise would not change their calculation. And also in that respect, actually, I think less could be more. I was actually struck, for instance, how Russian domestic discussion suddenly became more free when Trump was elected president of the United States, because that removed the notion of existential threat from the West, and that allowed people to start arguing for improving of relations with Europe and doing things to achieve that. So um, I'm not saying that we should elect Trump again, but I think um, a good way to go about it <clears throat> is actually what we sort of see happening in the United States, the slow re-professionalization -prof of foreign policy, decrease of, of polarization, Russia being a part of domestic debate. So I think if, um, if we don't come across as existential threat, um, then I think, we open up space for Russians to work towards their democracy themselves. And ultimately, you know, it's their country anyway. Uh, it's, it's theirs to democratize it or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's always little that, that we can do here. So let me stop here. Um. Thank you very much, Kadri. And if you'll allow me to kind of pick up on some of the points you raised, I think, you know, one of the, to me, with Borel Street, there were three things that went, you know, not entirely right. Uh, one, of course, is the timing. And the timing of that is even to me the least problematic because, as we all know, uh, there's never a good time to, uh, to, to try and invest in, in a relationship which has been so complicated. But of course, the second element is the press conference and that uh, both players and actors in that press conference could, uh, you know, make decisions on how to handle that press conference. And of course, escalating that conference into not just into Catalonia related issues, but even, uh, you know, telling the EU not to interfere in the internal affairs of the states of the Western Balkans, which happen to want to join the European Union, was a kind of degree of diplomatic signaling that uh, that to me was new uh, in, in EU-Russia interactions. And of course, the third uh, element of a visit was the choice, the political choice to expel uh, the diplomats from the three member states when, when, it, when it went. So, you know, there are several things piling up on, on each other. Uh, I also would note a bit what Andre mentioned and that expectation in Moscow that uh, uh, Borel's visit was about kind of lecturing Russia again. I mean, I, to me, this is very surprising because in the weeks preceding that visit, there was a lot of agitation in Europe about questioning whether the timing is right. Uh, and, you know, the underlying and the kind of everyone accepted that that visit is about uh, reopening the conversation on engagement with Russia. And, you know, the whole point of that visit was to, uh, to, 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 to bring a diplomatic olive branch to, uh, to Moscow. And in this sense, um, it's also striking to a degree, again, and not the first time, how the two sides are mistreating each other. Um, I, I'd also like to kind of perhaps develop one of the ideas that you touched upon, and that is this, Kadri, what you say is the Russian expectation of European decline. And of course, much of the European and American policy on Russia is predicated on the idea that Russia is declining. We know that Barack Obama said it pretty much openly, but I think most heads of European states and governments basically think that Russia is declining and will decline. And the wisest thing to do is to wait for another five or 10 years and Russian foreign policy will come back to earth and there will be a mutual and a easier basis of engagement. And apparently this is what Moscow thinks about the European Union itself. So I think there's a paradox in that. With that paradox, 
I think uh, both sides underinvest in dealing with realities of today, not with Russia or the European Union of 2050 or 2070. And that by that time, many things can go wrong. However, I think that if I look at Russia and the EU, the two sides decided to deal differently with the expectation of their partners decline. If I look at it, I see Russian foreign policy becoming more and more ambitious and active. And as I said to me, it was an, an interesting new twist, um, this lecture to the Euro that the European Union should not interfere in the internal affairs of the Balkan states. That's a kind of, if you want, a kind of increasing degree of uh, diplomatic messaging that is more ambitious. And in recent years, we've of course seen actions in the Central African Republic, Libya, uh, and many other places. I think the EU is, has decided, and also the Americans to a degree, have decided to deal with the decline by basically accommodating uh, Russia and thinking that um, we try to manage the rough, this rough patch, but eventually uh, at some point, uh, the economic realities uh, of Russia will, will force a foreign policy change. Um, and if I, again I look at what the West has been doing on Russia, of course the conversation and the news are dominated by sanctions, but what is not related, and I think we don't necessarily talk about so much, is that if you look at concrete foreign policy dossiers, I do see a lot of accommodation of Russian interests. You know, the last military, Western military intervention into a third country was 10 years ago in Libya. Uh, that policy which, you know, irritated Russia has stopped. Uh, there is much less lecturing of Russia than there was uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and even Jacques Chirac used to lecture more uh, Vladimir Putin on human rights in Chechnya than any European leader does today. So on that, there's kind of been a curve of accommodating Russian sensitivities. Of course, the all, all, all serious conversation about NATO enlargement to Ukraine and, and Georgia has stopped. Uh, and even if you look at the European conversation on the recent crisis in Belarus and, uh, you know, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, there was an explicit desire to, to design the European Union's policy towards this crisis in a way that does not uh, uh, irk Russia, that does not kind of irritate Russian sensitivities. So despite the fact that if you read the news, there is a lot of talk about sanctions on several uh, deeply profound, if you want, geopolitical trends, the Europeans have been quite accommodating uh, to, to Russian geopolitical preferences and interests for, for the last almost a decade. And even on sanctions, where I look at sanctions, I see an explicit choice not to target the Russian economy. Basically, sanctions on the Russian economy have been only implemented between the shooting down of MH17 and the Battle of Debaltseve, which is six months. And beyond that, all European, though not American, sanctions were only targeting uh, basically state officials. And there is also an explicit European decision not to target not just the Russian economy, but not even Russian businessmen, uh, which is again, if you want, is the least uh, assertive forms of sanctions. So all of these decisions uh, are, are a kind of explicit considerations in the European Union approach to Russia, which to me, again, makes this recent outreach by Jose Borrell uh, and the way it was handled so surprising. I will stop here with my uh, interventionism and I will open the floor to questions. Uh, there are several questions already in the chat box, but if uh, any of you would like to also address some of these questions uh, orally rather than in written form, please use the electronic function of raising your hand uh, and I will try to do a mix of, of uh, oral and written questions. So if you want to briefly comment or, or ask a question, uh, you can feel free to do so, uh, but please be brief. Now, uh, I will, having spoken uh, myself, I've on, I'm only now able to go and try and group the questions, but one question comes from Tony van der Togt, who is asking, what, would you, what do you expect Moscow to do in the neighborhood? Is there a risk of escalation around Donbas? And what about cooperation in higher education? Uh, that's one question. A second question I would have to the speakers is, 
you know, if you could give us a sense of the latest Russian vaccine, uh, foreign policy aspects uh, of, of like vaccine related Russian foreign policy. And just before coming on this call, I just realized an apparent paradox that I think two days ago, there was a batch of Russian Sputnik vaccines delivered into the Gaza Strip paid for by, uh, by the Emirates. Uh, and yesterday there was a small batch of Romanian uh, delivered vaccines into Transnistria. So you have this paradox where you have Sputnik in, in the Gaza Strip and uh, uh, Romanian delivered AstraZeneca in the region of Transnistria, which to me is an interesting and somewhat unexpected development of this kind of bubbling vac vaccine diplomacy that we're all watching on the sidelines of other foreign policy developments. Another question is about where are we with uh, North Stream? Uh, Kadri and Andre, if you could elaborate on that. Uh, and Carmen Claudine is asking, uh, what could be an imaginative policy of the EU towards Moscow? And that's a question I think addressed to Andre, but also Kadri, feel free to, to, to deal with it. Because at some point, Andre mentioned that he does not expect um, an, uh, any kind of uh, groundbreaking uh, ways the EU would be developing in the EU's approach to Russia. Another question is how far the new the Biden administration's attitude to Russia may impact relations with Europe from a Moscow state point. So I threw four or five, five questions at you. Uh, please try to address as many of them uh, in as as succinctly as you can. Andre, this, the floor is yours. And uh, the thank you. Uh, thank you, Nico. Uh, uh, let, let me try to be very brief. Uh, uh, on on Donbass, I think that uh, there is always a danger of escalation, unfortunately. And uh, if you do not uh, move uh, forward, you move uh, backward, I think that uh, can uh, generate uh, additional risks of what I would call inadvertent escalation. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know how to avoid it. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, probably work more on uh, confidence building measures, uh, but uh, the risks are there uh, and uh, any kind of settlement, quote unquote, uh, becomes uh, more elusive today than it was, uh, let's say, a year ago. Uh, in the end of the day, we will have to get back to the text of the Minsk agreements, in my opinion, and see uh, how we can uh, modernize the agreement. But definitely, there is no appetite uh, in the Kremlin uh, to, to do that. Uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, near abroad, you know, in my opinion, what we saw over last year uh, is a very clear uh, intention of Russia not to invest strategically uh, in uh, its neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we saw it during the uh, uh, political turmoil in Belarus. It was not used to pressure Lukashenko to accelerate the integration. Uh, and I think that economic subsidies to Lukashenko were quite modest. Uh, the events uh, in Kyrgyzstan were more or less ignored uh, by uh, Moscow. Uh, the only uh, uh, plea uh, to the new leadership of Kyrgyzstan was that you should stick to the commitments that your predecessors made um, on Moldova. <coughs> <coughs> of course, <coughs> Nick knows much better, but my take is that uh, the Russian attitude towards the results uh, of uh, elections uh, in Moldova were a kind of benign neglect, uh, and at least there was no attempt uh, to have a more active role in the Moldovan elections by, let's say, influencing the Russian diaspora or you know, doing something else. And finally, uh, if you take the crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, although you can argue that uh, in the end of the day, Putin turned out to be the only uh, peacemaker, but um, it's important to know that uh, the Russian uh, engagement was delayed in the first place and second, uh, of course, Russia allowed Turkey uh, to get its uh, foot uh, to the doorway. And uh, it's not a small thing because uh, in the end of the day, we are talking about uh, a NATO member. And uh, I could have, I could imagine how Russia would have reacted to another 
uh, NATO country uh, having direct uh, military uh, presence on the territory of the former Soviet Union. So I think that we see a change. It's not yet clear whether it is a tactical change or a strategic change, but uh, I would venture to say that uh, 2020 was very different uh, from what we saw before. Uh, maybe indeed it's a part of this uh, neo-isolationist trend that uh, uh, Kadri referred to, and this neo-isolationism uh, uh, is applied not just to uh, remote uh, uh, places of the planet, but also to the Russian immediate uh, neighborhood. Uh, on the North Stream, uh, it's hard to tell. I think it's not a matter of relations between Russia and the United States. Uh, it's an issue of relations between the United States and Germany. Uh, I think that both sides uh, would like to reach a compromise. Maybe the compromise will be that uh, the construction of the project will be completed, but the project will not be utilized uh, at its full capacity. And there might be some additional strings attached uh, aimed at uh, securing the Ukrainian transit uh, and also given the European Union yet another instrument uh, to punish Russia for any gross violations of human rights or inappropriate behavior uh, in Europe or elsewhere. So I think that some compromise uh, is likely to emerge, but uh, it's hard to, to predict uh, the uh, details uh, of this uh, compromise. Uh, finally, uh, uh, on... Uh, yeah, but, but, yeah. On, on, the, on the Western Balkans and on Kosovo, I think that uh, Russia is likely to accept uh, uh, any arrangement on Kosovo which uh, the Serbian leadership uh, can subscribe to. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Russia is not likely to incentivize uh, the Serbian leadership to make additional concessions, concessions uh, on uh, Kosovo. And, and finally, on imaginative policy. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. I personally think that the most imaginative initiative that uh, so far uh, we've got from the European Union uh, was the uh, Partnership for Modernization. Uh, it's uh, uh, 2010, Rostov and Don, November, uh, or oh, no, not sorry, but it was November, it was in May of 2010. And I think that uh, if uh, the European Union is considering a strategic approach to Russia, uh, this approach uh, should include uh, an attempt uh, to somehow cultivate and to groom and to assist potential constituencies of stakeholders in Russia uh, interested uh, in uh, more strategic relations with the European Union. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, non-security related uh, areas of cooperation might be instrumental uh, in pursuing this goal. That's why, you know, I think climate is important. I think uh, 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 information technologies, biotechnologies are important uh, and uh, uh, regional relations are also important. But it's, it's a big question. We will see what uh, the EU summit uh, will come up with uh, uh, as far as Russia is concerned. Uh, uh, well, maybe we'll see some uh, nuances and uh, uh, new approaches in place already this year. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Kadri? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a few questions. Yeah, well, Nord Stream, um, to me, it's basically a relationship management problem. Uh, to be honest, I'm a heretic on Nord Stream. I don't care whether it gets built or, or not. But I think it will be bad for Europe if it gets cancelled because of brutal American pressure, leaving Germany bitter and alone. Uh, and I think it's bad for Europe uh, if it goes ahead uh, against all resistance by Poland and leaving uh, Germany uh, look as a selfish country. So leaving the Ukraine question uh, aside, I mean, some people say that Nord Stream works as sort of military deterrence in Ukraine. I doubt, but you know, that's a separate set of questions. But otherwise, um, I think basically the best thing that could happen would be that, that Berlin and Washington reached some sort of compromise, some framework, uh, some rules of engagement that they could agree on. And 
that could potentially allow others to be on board as well, Poland's concerns to be addressed and, and so forth. So I think that would be the way ahead because the problem really above all is, is, is diplomatic. Um, now, imaginative uh, policy. Yeah, I don't think it's the question of imagination, really. I, I think, you know, there is lots of imagination. Uh, President Macron had his own uh, view, but was very creative. It doesn't work. I'm not a believer in it, but, but, but there are separate reasons for that. It was good thinking otherwise. Uh, you know, countries like Lithuania have their own thinking, Germany has its own. I think what is missing is the sort of real power base to make any of this a real policy. And that comes from elsewhere. So it's, I don't see it as, as lack of imagination. That is our problem right, right now. And a few questions to take from chat. Tony has asked uh, Borel, uh, new Russia policy, push back containment engagement, what's new in it. And there is also a question about climate change as a main opportunity for cooperation with Russia. Now, I think the latter, it, it sort of illustrates slightly uh, what I get wrong about these things. I think, yeah, we can talk climate with Russia and that could be, uh, but that could lead to something. But I think we need to approach it otherwise. We shouldn't use climate change as a venue for cooperation with Russia, but we should use Russia to combat climate change. I mean, the order of priorities ought to be the vice versa, and it should start with us and our policy. If we uh, list problems that have potential of, of cooperating with Russia, I don't think we will get anywhere. We should think what we need to do and, and, and what role does Russia play in that? And then, you know, engage or threaten or, or do whatever we, we, we need. And somehow it's, I don't know why, but it's somehow hard for us to think that way. Even though I think, you know, policy that have resorts of roots will, will have much bigger chance of succeeding because Russia is, my sort of sense is that the Kremlin is suspicious of policies that are devised by the EU to address the Kremlin. They are a lot more calm about policies that the EU adopts for its own sake to address some other problems. These are accepted as fact of life in the Kremlin and, and you could, could expect much more constructive reactions than something, you know, we, uh, we, we, we deliver as tailor-made for, for, for Russia. There is a raised hand, Nico. Someone wants to turn up in person. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. Um, we've addressed some of the questions that were asked in the chat box, but we'll still need to do another round. So I'll ask Dennis to comment or address a question. And if you could do it within 90 seconds, we will be very grateful. And then I'll, uh, I'll uh, group another round of questions and we'll go back to the speakers. Dennis, the floor is yours. Den is it my Dennis Fro? Okay, Dennis, you can ask your question now. Dennis, yes. that, thank you so much. Very, very simply, it's a small defense of Jose Borrell. Uh, the two previous high representatives, Kathy and Federico Borghini, were essentially party functionaries. Federico was very briefly a foreign minister. Borrell is a really tough political animal. He's lived in Catalonia and faced down the foulest Catalonian nationalism and I think been a very very good experienced political minister for Spain and when he went to Moscow he knew exactly what was going on he was treated oh I don't know the way Vyshinsky or Molotov might have treated somebody it was shameful of Russia to try to humiliate him lecture him uh, expel the three diplomats while he was there and I think that stripped away an awful lot of illusions at that level, the Borrell visit, in my view, paradoxically, was a success because the rest of Europe saw that Russia was utterly uninterested in dealing with the European Union as such. Yes, it wants bilateral German relations. It loves it when Macron says we must be friends with uh, Russia. That, and that, that, that suits the Kremlin, in my view. 
but just if Borrell hadn't gone there, we wouldn't have seen the real face of how Russia thinks diplomacy should be done. Thank you very much, Denis. Um, I mean, there's a kind of, uh, it's, it's a somewhat, it's quite a big meeting, but we try to keep it as interactive as possible and have it as a kind of more or less conversation. But if, if you know, people like, and I won't say surnames here, but if people like Pierre or Wolfgang or, or Norbert uh, or Stephen, you feel like weighing in and chipping in and, and commenting very briefly on some of the things we, you heard, I think we would all benefit from this. Um, we still have a couple of questions to address. And one is about uh, uh, the new generation of Russian uh, governmental and senior and you know, soon to be senior decision makers. Uh, Kadri, maybe you could deal uh, with that question for a couple of minutes um, uh, very briefly. And of course, we did recently a study and because the name Molotov was mentioned here, in, in the paper uh, written by Kadri, uh, uh, there's a moment where basically she interviewed several young Russian diplomats and GIMO students. And uh, I think Molotov was as respected among this generation of, of future or current Russian diplomats as someone as Evgeny Primakov, which to me was, was a bit of a surprise. Uh, Vitold, one minute if you want to say something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let me be uh, a bit provocative, uh, because uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, my argument would be that this treatment of Borel was not a mistake. It was not because uh, there was expectation that they didn't know what the intention of the visit was, because uh, as, as Nico said, it was quite obvious what the intention was. I think it was it is an attempt to redefine the relationship. It's not that Russia is not interested in dealing with uh, European countries and even EU, but it wants to redefine the relationship. And it's a function of these two factors that had been mentioned before, uh, the feeling that the EU is powerless and cannot do anything. And the second, the, the, the super sensitivity over the internal issues. And in that sense, it was, uh, it is a process, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, the policy is working. And uh, what Nico said about uh, growing accommodation uh, is is I think I think he's if he's right, then then it's working. Uh, so this was just a, a, tr a treatment. It was a kind of a softening up, as it were. You know, they don't want us to. Uh, they don't want the EU to react to certain things even on the level that had been acceptable so far. It's a, it's a conditionality, it's a new conditionality that Russia is introducing into the relationship. Thank you, Vitold. Uh, so, Kadri and Andre, do you have a round of reactions, perhaps? I, I can, um, on, um, they even sort of go together. On next generation, uh, yes, it was most amazingly interesting work. And there is a different thinking in the new generation, but not necessarily in ways we would like to see. Uh, what struck me was that many of them actually want, you know, some rule of law, uh, rules, the rules and decency in, in, in Russia, even, even democracy, you could say, but they are not pro-Western. Uh, so, and that is something that we will find hard to adapt to, but you can have democracy that is not pro-Western, um, while I would argue that it is, it is still good, even if it is homegrown and approaches the West as well as powers that be in Russia with healthy dose of, of skepticism. But yeah, we shouldn't expect uh, these trends that are embryonic anyway to translate into foreign policy positions anytime uh, soon. Um, to Vital, uh, and yes, I, I think to redefine the relationship, exactly, that's what they try to do, they try to to, to show very clearly that Russia is not in the position of rule taker anymore and we shouldn't have rose illusions. 
But my question still would be, did we have those illusions? I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think still it sort of traumatized the sensitivity that caused the Moscow, Moscow reaction. And Barbara asks in the chat about um, uh, whether the EU should uh, step back from the internal situation in Russia and do nothing. I'm not saying we should do nothing. Um, and what exactly we should do is, is actually a good and difficult question. I think we should use the leverage we might have through Council of Europe mechanisms, even though it is a limited and, and Russia doesn't <clears throat> live up to their obligations anyway. Um, we should support the Russian organizations that have decided to work in the West. Yes, absolutely. And there are many and they do good work and they engage with people who are based in Russia and work in Russia. Um, but I think we should take it into account that Russia tends to be a top down country. So the actual change sort of tends to come from above. So what I have actually tried to do in, in my own limited work in Russia is to facilitate contacts between those who work with the Kremlin and those who don't, because maybe it's my memory that is misleading me here, or uh, memory is correct. Uh, I, I wonder if a parallel is correct. The Soviet Union started democratizing when the sensible power holders started talking to dissidents and, and, and intelligentsia. And I would sort of want such cross public conversation to happen in Russia. I think that could be much more fertile than sort of a crusade to support, to support pro-Western opposition. Thank you, Kadri. Andre, two minutes, if you have anything to react to. First of all, uh, let me say that I, I fully subscribe to the idea that the EU policy towards Russia uh, should be uh, focused non on Russia, not on Russia proper, but rather on problems. Uh, so problem-based approach is uh, arguably the right approach that Brussels can, uh, uh, can take. Uh, when Russia can become a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem itself, uh, uh, then the European Union might uh, extend uh, opportunities for working with Moscow. Uh, second, uh, there was a question about what can be done uh, uh, specifically. I can tell you that uh, we are working uh, right now at the Russian International Affairs Council together with our counterparts at the uh, uh, Portuguese embassy uh, working uh, on the uh, presidency of uh, uh, Portugal in the European Union and uh, how we can insert uh, the Russian factor uh, into the overall EU agenda. Of course, uh, it gets down to standard issues uh, like public health uh, and uh, climate change. Uh, it will not make a revolution, but I think that we should at least uh, keep uh, these uh, contacts alive uh, and we should uh, try uh, to work in areas uh, which are not uh, uh, yet uh, uh, saturated uh, uh, with the uh, political poison. So uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, we should think globally, but we should act locally. And uh, there are opportunities specific, uh, maybe not uh, very uh, great opportunities that can be explored. Uh, and finally, in the end of the day, let me say that uh, I agree that it is a situation of mutual, a balance of mutual weaknesses. I agree with Nikos that both sides consider that the other side uh, is in the state of strategic decline. Uh, and that means, uh, among other things, that the future of the relationship will not be, uh, will not, uh, be defined by their tactical victories or defeats, but will be defined by the future of the international system at large. Uh, a, and uh, one of the visions uh, of the international system should ultimately prevail. It's either the European vision or the vision of Mr. Putin, and that would uh, I mean uh, the outcome of, of this uh, very complex and controversial relationship. Thank you very much. And I suggest we end here. We're only three minutes late. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking part in this call. I hope it was useful. And I'm sure that's a conversation that will continue. Uh, and we'll also do our best uh, to make sure that this conversation will continue in track two, track three, and all the possible tracks that a think tank can work on. 
thank you very much and i hope to see uh, you soon uh, back to some follow up events that we're planning on russia and the eastern partnership and the balkans and turkey have a nice day and a nice weekend tomorrow and the day after tomorrow bye bye